right, good morning, everybody. Good, mo good morning. Okay, we can talk quiet, that's fine. I'm going to be in a talking loud mood, but you can stay in the talking quiet mood. Um, welcome to Connors Hill and Southeast as well. We are digging in uh, today um, right on the front end of, of where we're going this year, talking about how to thrive. And talking this year about the fact that God actually does desire a blessing for our lives. And the invitation in Psalm 1 to look a little bit beneath the surface, uh, not just at like this moment, but at actually how have we structured, how have we organized our lives? What are the rhythms and practices of our lives? So at the end of my talk on September 10th, I, I laid out like a starter structure. Do you want to get your, your life structured in a way that has lots of space for God? Um, we're going to dig into that structure over the next four weeks, those, those four kind of starter pieces. Um, but today, I, there, there's a really important building block, <laughs> and I want to talk about the gospel. I want to invite you today to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ, and not only gospel, but our stories in terms of how we carry the things that God has done in our lives. So I'll say more about this in a bit, but let me just say up front, if you go into your life and you try to build religious rhythms and practices, but you do not have a life-giving relationship day in and day out with the Savior and the Lord and the Son of God and your friend, Jesus Christ, it's not going to be different than anything else you learned on Instagram that you're trying to implement. It's going to be like everything else, that you kind of start with a lot of fire and then it kind of, you know, fuses out over time. The invitation first is respond to Jesus. And that's where I want to hang out uh, today. Our gospel, the gospel, and our stories. And this thought to start out today. It's very hard to tell someone they need to change. Have you experienced this? Uh, we live our whole lives thinking about how the other people in our lives need to change. But... And it should be hard. I mean, it should be hard. I don't want to encourage you in, in, in uh, having awkward conversations, but it's hard to tell somebody they need to change. But it's actually really easy to share good news with somebody, even if it's going to require a lot of change in their lives. People clap and laugh and cry at, it's a boy, it's a girl, but not realizing, maybe at that moment, this calls a lot out of you, <laughs> if you're hearing that news. Um little thought experiment. Imagine that I said to you, or you said to me, I said to you, uh, look, it's time for you to take care of all the 90% finished renovations in your house. Get it done. Dap and paint the baseboards. You know, get that 1970s air conditioner out of the wall that you don't use anymore. And also, do you know what you should do? You should go to your storage room and go throughout your closets, and you have all kinds of junk you know, throw away stuff, give stuff to goodwill, sell stuff, get your house organized. What would you say if I said to you? you? You'd maybe say what I say, which is like, you're totally right. And stop talking to me like that. I can manage my own business. I like the level of junk that I live in. I would yell something at you. But somebody actually said something sort of like this to me a couple years ago. And me and my whole family cheered. Can you imagine that? A little bit of backstory. Um, maybe you're imagining some of this, but um, a couple years ago, we got connected with this house that we thought maybe we were supposed to buy and move into. And uh, we looked at it, and one thing led to another, and we ended up putting an offer on it. And we were the sixth offer. The first offer was accepted. We were sixth in line, but our realtor called us to let us know that we, even though we were sixth, were accepted as the backup offer. So our realtor said, look, 95% of the time the first offer goes through, you're probably not going to get this house. But they've got a week, the first offer, they get to decide if they're going to buy it or not. And next week, next Monday at 7 p.m., we'll find out if the first offer falls through and you may have a chance. So it was actually a really cool week because we were like, God, if this is a bad idea... <laughs> We would like you to give it to the first people, you know? <laughs> and, but if this is a door that you want to open for us, like, we'll celebrate in that. And we're excited about it, but, you know, God, please, be powerful in this. So I'm driving with my family um, somewhere, 6 o'clock on the night where 7 o'clock was the deadline, and our realtor calls. And our realtor knows us, loves us. Um, we walked and known her for many, many years. She's a friend. 
And she said, well, I have some news. She said, the first offer fell through. It's yours if you want it. And we cheered. We cheered. We were like, you got to be kidding me. We're not expecting that it was actually going to go in this way. But what she actually said was, really, you guys, the next six months is going to be painful. Have you guys moved recently? (laughs) You are going to have to dap and paint those baseboards. You are going to have to pull that 1970s air conditioner out of the wall that was built in to the exterior wall of your house. You're going to have to go through all the stuff you've been ignoring in your storage rooms, and your closets. And then you're basically going to have to do just as much work to box it all up and go renovate the new place and move in. It was terrible. If I wrote a, a book, like if I wanted to write like a, like a horror story, it would be those six months, you know, basically. But because she said it to us different, she saw, she wasn't just calling us to the work, she was calling us to the new vision for our lives. She could see our family in that house. And she, like we, were celebrating the potential, and we're really actually thankful that we are in it. So as we think about the gospel, (laughs) the good news of God, and our stories, how we carry them, I want to invite you into the simple truth. The way that the word gospel is used in the scripture is meant, it's meant to always mean good news. (laughs) Is that how you've responded? And is that how you carry it? So in this passage today, um, there's a lot of things woven together in this passage. We're going to try to unweave uh, four big things. One of them I'm not going to give a lot of attention to. But if we were studying the book of Corinthians, Paul has planted the church of Corinth. There are people in that church, and he's elsewhere now because he's an itinerant missionary. He's elsewhere. There's people in that church who are sort of dissing him. They're saying the ministry of Paul is not valid. So part of this passage, he's, he's actually defending his ministry by looking to the example of Jesus Christ. But as he defends his ministry, saying, what I have started in Corinth is valid and I'm still a voice that you should be listening to, he unpacks three topics, which are really where we're going to look today. He, He talks about the good news, and it's all woven together. He talks about the way that God changes a person when they come to believe in the good news. And he talks about the call and invitation of God to share his good news with others. So as we start stepping into this series of how we thrive in life, this is where it actually has to start. I want to unweave these things. I want to bring some clarity to these areas. What is the good news of Jesus Christ? Second, how does God transform a person who receives the good news? And third, what does it look like for us to join with God as his co-workers, as this passage says, in actually sharing the good news with others. So jumping into these things is sort of a bedrock of where we're going this year. Number one, the gospel. The good news is God's comprehensive plan to set all things right. The Bible tells a story that is all encompassing past, present, and future, and it meets us where we actually live. But it tells the story with the good news. When the scripture talks about our past, it speaks to us this truth that we don't always live in, that this universe we live in, and all of humanity, and even you, and even the person sitting next to you, are all created with goodness and with purpose. God created you. He is creative. He is good. He had a good idea, and that idea was you, (laughs) and he created you. Is there other stuff that's come into your life? Is there sin and brokenness? Yes, that's not his gift to you. But he had the idea of you. That's our past. Our present, though, is we live in this place where it's not fully realized. We live in a place where we hurt others, where they hurt us, where there's many aspects of the created order that are broken and not working properly, and we find ourselves stuck in sin and stuck in the consequences of sin. And sin is just the Bible's word for anything that's not good for relationships. Anything that comes into the way of my relationship with God or my relationship with people is sin. And in the present, we find ourselves not only sinning, hurting, and being hurt, but stuck. Have you ever tried to change? (laughs) It's very difficult. And the future that we find ourselves in is this reality that we want salvation, we want deliverance, we want things to be put back together and work properly, But we know the trajectory we're headed towards. Watch any movie, read any news feed. We know there's an explosion coming. 
<laughs> it's like we just can't put the pieces back together in our own strength. And into this story of stuckness and of despair comes Jesus Christ. The story of the Son of God who came to forgive our sins by dying on the cross, who rose from the dead to break the power of evil, and who, Scripture says, is coming again to do what? To renew, uh, to, to, to renew and restore all things and to establish His kingdom. This is the gospel, God's comprehensive plan to set all things right now. Five things we see, and I'm going to jam through these, don't try to write them all down, uh, about the gospel uniquely in this passage. I'm not giving you an exhaustive list about everything. But five things we see in here. So first of all, the gospel is the true story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying for the sins of the world. Listen to verse 19. Listen to this. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God was in Christ. <laughs> Sometimes people see this discrepancy between like Old Testament, holy, justice, powerful God, and New Testament, Jesus, love your enemy. No, no, no. Scripture tells us God was in Christ. Christ is God the Son, and Christ was God reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. It's a historical reality. It's news. This is something that's happened. The cross and the resurrection and the promise of the return of Christ have happened. Secondly, we see in the same verse, the gospel is relational at its core. The gospel is not the beginning of a new religion, the adding of rules to human existence. What was happening? God was reconciling the world to himself. Come back to that in a minute. When Jesus talks about the gospel in John 3, how does he start? <laughs> he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so this verse, verse 19, says God was reconciling the world. He was restoring the relationship. The gospel is, is not about a list of rules and religiosity that needs to be followed to have a good life. It's a, it, it, it's a romance between a creator God and humanity and the restoration of that relationship. Third, in all of this, the gospel is not first, listen to this, about something that we must do. But it's first about something that God has already done. It's news. <laughs> 18, verse 18. All of this is from God. You know, any of Paul's letters, as you look at them, the structure of most of them is like half and half. He starts by talking about what God has done and then moves to how we should respond to what God has done. It's because the gospel is not a call to do better things in your life. It's news about what Christ has done. So catch this. The problems we experience in the world, according to Scripture, were not created by God. They came up because of our decision to sever our relationship with God. They are our problem. Now, have you ever fought with another human being? If not, I highly recommend it. It helps you grow up a little bit. But whenever you fight with another human being, almost always in my life, both people need to apologize at the end. <laughs> you know, for me... Maybe somebody else started and that, it was that person's fault, but then all of a sudden in my reaction, I also sin against them and we have to come back to reconciliation. We both need to apologize. Not so with our relationship with God. He has never had a misstep. <laughs> he has never spoken out of turn. He's never made a mistake. It's our problem. And yet, listen to this. Where we were powerless and enemies of God, God comes in to fix the problem. He actually pays the price for our reconciliation. And this is, this is not first an invitation. This is first news. It's happened. It's finished. M many uh, writers and, and theologians have, have uh, given versions of this metaphor. You know, put yourself in a, in a Middle Ages sort of fortified walled city. You know, and we've got the gates shut because the enemy is coming and he's rampaging against, against the, uh, the countryside. And we know we're next. And so we're in there. We're starving because, you know... We can't go out and get our crops. We're just waiting for the, the axe to fall <laughs> for our city. And then we see somebody riding on a horse with desperation towards the city. And we're like, oh my goodness, what is, what is happening? Is this going to be the guy telling us that we're, we're next? 
we're the next city. And he, and he comes, he's got a smile on his face, and he says to us, no, the enemy has been defeated. Somebody is on the throne that wants peace for all. Open the gates, raise the flags, go to your fields, live your life. We do not need to fear anymore. Things have been set right. This is the gospel. We're geared up to fight the enemy, and some Christians think that's what they're supposed to do. Let me tell you, the enemy is defeated. It's already happened. It's already done, and it's now working itself out in history. You do not have to win the battle. Can you just take that burden and put it on the empty chair next to you? The battle is won. The work is finished. The kingdom is coming. It's first news before it's an invitation. Fourth, take a deep breath here. The gospel allows us to have our sins forgiven and share in God's blessings. Verse 21, powerhouse verse, could do the whole sermon on this verse, but God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's this exchange on the cross. God in Jesus Christ takes all the sin, yours, the person next to you, all of humanity, on himself. And he's a perfect sacrifice. He's sinless. He chooses to take it on himself out of love so that our sin can be forgiven. But it doesn't stop there. Then he gives us his righteousness. He puts his spirit in us. And righteousness really just means like right relationships. The desire and ability to have the sort of relationships with God and others that are good, that thrive. This happens on the cross. And fifth, the gospel is for all people. Verse 14, and all through scripture, it says very clearly that Jesus died for all. Gospel is God's plan what's been accomplished to set things right. I had this friend I called one day and I said, we're going to be driving through your city. Uh, me and my family, my wife and my four children, we're going to be in your city coming through. Uh, we would love to see you. And what I was really saying is we're looking for free lodging. And he said, uh, he said, well, we would really like to see you too. That would be great. He said, unfortunately, we don't have a very big place. He said, but we have this hotel. There's a hotel, well, he doesn't have a hotel, but there's a hotel near us, and it's a great place, great room for families. You guys stay there, and then we'll just hang out with you when you're here, and we'll eat supper and these, these sorts of things. And I said, okay. So he reserved the hotel. We stayed there. Um, as I was getting up in the morning and preparing to go down and, and pay for the hotel, I got a text from him and said, hey, just so you know, we wish we had room in our house to keep you. Because we don't, I'm paying for your hotel. We're just going to pretend the hotel is part of our house. I'm paying for the hotel. This is my treat. And something inside of me, I wasn't really angry or anything, but maybe I wanted to prove that I was an adult or, you know, I don't know if I was prideful. But I, I texted him back and I'm like, nah, you don't have to do that. It's fine. We stayed in the hotel. It's my family. We'll pay. And I went to the front desk and said, you know, get rid of his credit card, give you my credit card. I'll pay. The whole road trip, I deeply regretted my decision. I want that money back. Today, as I stand here years later, I'm like, what was I doing like a friend said i want to show you hospitality i want to pay for your hotel i said no that's just foolish that's just foolish and so this offer from god the price has been paid the the opportunity is open the, this is the news do you read this in verse 19 you can say this with joy to your friends and family and neighbors and to your own soul god is no longer counting sins against them against you that that's the time we're in that's the time we're in. It's right here. Look it up. 2 Corinthians 5.19. God is no longer counting sins against people. The gospel is not our chance to get right with God. It's God's declaration that he has already made things right with us. And so if you're not right with God or a friend or family member or neighbor is not right with God, that's your thing. That's not God's thing. <laughs> you might blame it on him, but it's not his thing. The gospel is good news for all people, do you believe? Okay, second, let's keep moving. The gospel will radically transform anyone who believes it for the better. The gospel will radically transform anyone who believes it for the better. What happens when we are reconciled to God? One commentator says, I think there's a more compelling vision than a lot of us live. He says, when Jesus called us to take up our cross and find new resurrection life in him. 
he probably had more something radical in mind than driving to an air-conditioned sanctuary, saying amen a couple times to whatever's happening on stage, and returning to your real life of Sunday TV and family fun after a delicious meal at the restaurant everyone wants to go to. He says, God's righteousness is all comprehensive, all embracing, life transforming. Little conviction in that little paragraph there. What happens when we are reconciled to God? Five things. I'm kind of on a five things thing today. First, my favorite point of the day. What happens when we're reconciled to God? First, we're reconciled to God. I don't know if you can capture that. Without Jesus Christ, your relationship with the one who created you, with the one who set everything spinning in this entire universe is broken. When you come through Christ, you're reconciled. And just to think about this in terms of how we experience our lives, um, think back to when you've had tension with another person in your relationship or where there's been a, a falling out. If you are healthy, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> There's an angst and a tension in your heart. You know, whether it's a husband and wife or a parent and a child or some of your extended family or a neighbor who, you know, thinks you wrecked their lawn or somebody you work with or, you know, whoever it is, there's a tension in your heart. But think about this. For many and most people, there's times where we actually don't have broken relationships with people, but we still have angst in our hearts. Where's that from? <laughs> the gospel says it's because things aren't right in our soul. And, and this is the reality of how we live when we don't have the hope of Christ and the relationship with God through him. There's an angst. There's a hunger. There's an emptiness. There's a tension. And through Christ, when we are reconciled to God, that God relationship sits at like the deepest part of our souls. It's like, it's like those, those places in the bottom of the ocean, you know, that you can't get to and your sub's probably going to explode if you go to. Those are the places where God can bring peace deep down. And this sense of hope for the future that we try to find in all kinds of other self-help sort of ways, that full and complete and total hope that whatever comes your way, you're still a person of hope because you know your destiny. That is only available through God. But it is available through God when we're reconciled to him. We're reconciled with God. Second, we become a new person and get a fresh start. We don't just add a new layer of healthy rhythms to our life. Ah, it's a little better. I go to church on Sundays now. It's good, but it's more than that. You're a new person. Verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Jesus, when he talks about salvation, talks about it being a new birth. Our, our, our society is consumed, because we're an individualistic society, with trying to know our identity. What is my identity? And trying to secure our destiny. And these things we sort out in so many ways. We get stuff and build wealth. And stuff is fun for a little while. And then it doesn't make much difference after a while. We pursue popularity. You know, whether that's through social media or through trying to show that you're really better than the social media people by not having social media. That's what I do. Um, you know, so that you like me. <laughs> I want to tell you I don't use social media, so you like me. Uh, we have all these discussions about race and gender and sexuality, thinking we will find our identity through these things. Maybe we're pursuing intelligence. How many books have you read? Most of us are pursuing looking better, you know, until a certain age. And then we just give up. That was a few years back for me. Um, politics. Where do you land on the political spectrum? That's who I am. What sign do you put on your lawn? This one <laughs> new immigrant that was in our old uh, neighborhood, I loved it. He put every political sign on his lawn. <laughs> Like he wanted to be friends with everybody, and I don't know if he knew how it all worked, but um, it was very inviting. You know, I'm for everybody. Um, or maybe we're just working for self-esteem. We're just working to make our hearts feel better. You know, jump on the elliptical, then you won't be stressed out anymore. We pursue identity and securing our destiny through all of these things. But when you come into Jesus, you become a new person. You get a fr fresh start. 
And the, the, the claim of Scripture and my encouragement to you today is to believe you will not actually find yourself in a secure place of identity, and you will not be secure in your destiny until you find those things in Jesus Christ. Because everything else fades. Everything else is not secure. There's nothing in this world. There's no watertight RRSP or vacation home or health plan or anything that's going to secure those things for you. You will not know who you are until you find yourself as the loved and reconciled child of a good and loving creator, God and Father. Whatever your age, until you find yourself sitting on his lap just knowing that you are loved because you are his child before you have performed at all. (laughs) With all the stuff you've brought, he loves you. That's when all of a sudden things change in your life. You get reconciled with God. He'll make you into a new person totally. Third in this powerful verse, we see everyone, including Jesus, from a different perspective. Now, this is a society transforming verse, if it would happen. Verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one. So God did this change in me through Jesus Christ. So now, from now on, rest of our lives, not only has God changed me, but now I don't act, we don't see anyone from a worldly point of view. We don't see anyone that way anymore. Imagine if we looked at one another and we weren't thinking about one another's looks or weight. (laughs) And we weren't thinking about how much money that other person has or what sort of clothes that they wore. Or we weren't thinking of how connected they are in in the community and how they can get me connected with a job or my kids on a sport team or whatever. We don't regard people that way anymore as followers of Jesus Christ. We regard everybody as the loved and cherished child of the God of the universe, and it changes how we look at each other. You know, we see stuff that's not working right in the lives of others with love and compassion and all that you would be reconciled to know the Father loves you before you started trying this morning. (laughs) Um, That's why the Jewish day, by the way, starts in their understanding with sunset. With sunset. And it ends after sunset. Because the first and what mo- most important thing that you and I should do, it's the gospel built into creation. The first and most important thing you and I should do every day is go to bed <laughs> and rest in the reality that God is working before we do anything. God is loving and accepting and filling before we do anything. And then you wake up halfway through the day, you know, at 6 a.m. <laughs> and you respond to the good God who's been working all night. Beautiful, beautiful picture. I uh, want to keep moving here. Um, fourth, we live different lives. Following the example of Jesus, characterized by loving God and others. Verse 14. Now, new people, new people of the kingdom. Christ's love compels us. Boy, what a huge verse. What's compelling you these days? What's giving you gas in your engine? What makes you get out of bed and work in the morning? Because healthy people work, by the way. But what is it? Boy, it's not always Christ's love for me. But that's the clean gas. That's the, you know, whatever you're 93, 95. I don't know how much ethanol we can get going these days. That's the good gas. (laughs) When the love of Christ is compelling you. Verse 15, so we who have died in Christ should no longer live for ourselves, but for him. Verse 21, that we could become the righteousness of God. Just think on this. Righteousness is right relationships. So scripture says that when when God comes in, he transforms our heart. He takes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. And practically, what this looks like is that God will start making you think about how to have good relationships. <laughs> That's pretty cool. This is what righteousness is. This is the gift of the righteousness of God. We'll start thinking, you know, daydreaming about, I wonder how my relationships could be better. But it doesn't start at thinking. It, it moves to wanting. You know, the promise of the Holy Spirit is that you would be moved to want the right things, your desires. But it doesn't stop with wanting. It moves to deciding. That you start to decide to do things, even hard things that are better for relationships with your relationship with God and one another. And you don't just stop with deciding, you actually do. (laughs) You do the things 
that are better for relationships. And, and, and this is when the church gets it totally wrong. You know, when we get puffed up with head knowledge or we get puffed up with pride, and we're actually not doing things that make relationships good. Somebody was just telling me this morning that some of the hardest people they have to interact with in their lives are other Christians. Some of the people who give them the hardest time or the hardest to just find peace with are other Christians with these very strong and loud and yelly views. Seriously? (laughs) I mean, it's good that God is growing us and we challenge each other and refine one another and press on towards truth and maturity. But God wants to help you think and want and decide and do the things that will mature your relationships. That's what it is. That's what the kingdom is. Lastly, number five, we are given the privilege of persuading others to be reconciled to God. Verse 18, listen to this. All of this is from God. He reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I'm going to talk about that a little more in my last point, but immediately, when you come to Christ and you're reconciled with God, you want to help other people reconcile with God. And you want to reconcile your relationships with other people. And you want to help other people reconcile their relationships with one another. And you live then your whole life at essentially getting better at those things. That's what the Christian life is. Learning and growing and becoming more effective in having a good relationship with God and other people and helping others have a good relationship with God and other people. (laughs) So when God reconciles you, he puts the ministry of reconciliation in you. Have you seen people be changed when the love of God invades their heart by his grace? I've even heard many testimonies of people who didn't ask for it. Um, I remember a guy I knew back in the day, and he was a religious guy, but he was like a crunchy, kind of angry, harsh, religious guy. (laughs) Christian guy. He knew the Bible, and he would let you know that he knew the Bible. And something happened to him that he didn't ask for. It happened accidentally, just by God's grace. But he had this experience where the grace of God, where he experienced the grace of God. He experienced what I was talking about earlier with words, but he experienced the love of God, the overwhelming love of God in, in a moment, in an evening. That, that overflowed his heart. That, that, that thing that's like, you know, when you experience, like, I'm just a child sitting on God's lap. He's embracing me, loving me. <laughs> He experienced it, and he changed. He actually didn't get any less passionate about truth, but his grace vial filled up. (laughs) And he became soft, and he became gentle, and he began to work to restore relationships he had hurt. And in a powerful, Holy Spirit-y way, he actually became fuller of truth, deeper in truth, because it was now not just head knowledge, it was, it was truth experienced. And he began to carry the truth in a more real way that he could actually share and actually be heard. The gospel will radically transform your life if you believe it and run after it. And it will transform you for the better. So, Paul says, be reconciled to God. The sense is, come back to God. He's your source. He's your creator. He is your identity, whether you accept him as your identity or not. All those other things, your your stuff and your popularity and your politics and your intelligence and your gender and your sexuality and your race and your looks and all these things can only be found in that relationship with God. Come back to God. He will show you your identity and secure your destiny. Did you hear verse 2 of chapter 6? Now is the time of God's favor. Do you know and believe to the depth of your soul that God looks favorably upon you? (laughs) God looks with favor on your friends, family, your neighbors, your co-workers, students you go to school with. 
There's only one of two positions a person can be in. Sitting on God's lap as his loved child. Or running away an orphan by choice with a loving God pursuing. (laughs) So the only two positions available in our world today. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of God's salvation. Lastly, the gospel third spreads as we share our stories motivated by love. As we share our stories, when we come to know Jesus, we get to work in sharing him. And I think those of you who are a regular part of worshiping community would agree, some of the most powerful stories we hear are baptismal stories. They're day one stories. You literally, it's like you're reborn, you know, some uncomfortable metaphor actually in all the water and all that, but you're reborn and immediately you have a story. Second number one. Now, hopefully you also have a day 10 story and a year one story and, you know, hopefully God is continuing to work in your life. But, you know, when Jesus calls his disciples to follow them, six months later, he sends them out on mission without him. And sometimes we can think to ourselves, well, I've only been following Christ for 20 years. I don't know if I'm really equipped and ready to share my story, you know, with an unbeliever of what God has done in my life. And yet probably one of your most powerful evangelistic moments was when you stood before getting baptized and told your story. You've still got that story. (laughs) And hopefully there's more. Do you tell it? When we know Jesus, we get to work sharing him. Paul says we become God's co-workers. We become Christ's ambassadors. And just a couple encouragements here. Just a couple encouragements here. In verse 10, before today's passage, Paul writes this. He says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for things done well in the body, whether good or bad. Pretty intense verse. Judgment day is coming, and it will be a day of salvation, and it will be a day of wrath depending on your relationship with the Lord. Verse 11, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. I love this verse. And it really was highlighted to me this week as a challenge to me personally in my life. And really this three-letter word just like highlighted on the page, try. (laughs) Try. Try. Try to persuade others. It was like the Holy Spirit was asking me, are you trying? You know, I love the word try because it's like, number one, do something. Get active after it. Give it a shot. You know, you maybe never shot a basketball in your life, but throw it up towards the rim and see what happens. But try also contains in it like, it's probably not going to work a lot of times. And you probably need to get better at it over time. But just try. And I just felt the Lord saying to me, and I want to say to us, What if we tried? What if we tried to persuade others? Verse 14 says Christ's love compels us. So we're not trying to manipulate others. We're not trying to arm twist others. We're trying to persuade others. Persuasion is a loving conversation where you talk about things that matter and listen to how people are thinking and try to help people see, you know, why your phone is better than their kind of phone or whatever it is. You're not trying to hit them over the head. You're trying to persuade them. And verse 14 says, in the love of Christ. Just one more thought before I close here. I was meeting with a pastor a couple weeks ago from another church, or another church in, in the region. And they've seen a lot of people come to Christ in the last number of months. And I was just asking him, what's that look like? Where does that come from? How's that going? And lots of really beautiful golden nuggets in there. But he said one thing that I just thought fit with this try that I wanted to say to you. <laughs> he said, you know, one thing that happened in our church is we stopped telling people to invite people to church. And you might think, I thought he was going a particular way with that comment. But what he said is, now we just tell him to bring people to church. I thought he was going the other way. I thought he was just going to say, just let it happen organically. But he's like, now we tell him to bring them. Don't invite them. Bring them. (laughs) And there's this New Testament story of, you know, the friends bringing their uh, friend on a mat to Jesus' feet. Jesus heals and forgives. They brought him. And he just said, you know, and we never do this through manipulation or arm twisting, of course, because we love the people. But... You know, oftentimes, maybe you've been in a conversation where you're talking with somebody who doesn't participate in church, and maybe they're going through a tough time, or maybe their heart is open to conversation. You say, well, you can come to church with me if you want to. And sometimes people will say, never. But sometimes people will say, 
sure, yeah, that, maybe I could do that sometime. And then you sort of wait for when they're going to call you on a Sunday morning and they're like, hey, it's 9 a.m., I ate my eggs, I got my button-up shirt on, should we go? And it, it, the call doesn't come, you know? But he said they've had so much fruit in reversing that. And you be the person to say, great, can I pick you up at 9.30 on Sunday? Let's do this. <laughs> they've just seen so much fruit in that when, when, when there are people who are open to the gospel of Christ. He said, we don't invite them, we just bring them. <laughs> and let God do the work that he does. So that's just an encouragement. The word try, and I, I got I to gotta take on try. I got to take on try. Are you trying to persuade? Are you trying to persuade others? Who are the people in your life today that might be open to hearing how Jesus has saved and changed your life? And would you have the courage to tell them? Do your best to not do it awkwardly, okay? I mean... Let's know people. Let's love people. Let's talk about things that matter. <laughs> but would you try? The gospel is God's comprehensive plan to set all things right. It will radically transform anyone who believes. And it spreads and has been sh spreading for millennia as believers share their stories motivated by love. Three on ramps. First, questions. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? It's not complicated. Pray to God in the quietness of your heart that you're ready to, to give this a shot and go tell somebody who is a Christian that you did it. <laughs> Second, are you regularly telling your story with love and urgency? May God grow our trying. Third, what next step, simple question, is Jesus inviting you to take today? Next week, we're looking at John 15, powerful how to thrive passage. We're going to respond in worship. Would you stand with me and at Connors Hill and Southeast as well? And let me pray. So, Father, I have said a lot of words, um, but just want to pray like we always pray. Would you, for each soul who's listening, <laughs> would you help the seeds that really mattered stick and find good, soft soil and take deep root in this time? God, maybe you're encouraging each person to one or two things. I pray you would give us excitement and a willing spirit to participate and follow you in the ways that you are inviting us towards greater abundance, towards greater flourishing and thriving, towards greater blessing and better relationships in our lives, God. We just say we are so thankful to you, God, that while we were still your enemies, you came for our rescue. Thank you for the best news of all, that there is hope because of you. Lead us on in this new life. Teach us, grow us. We worship you in Jesus' name.